The following is a presentation of Surprise Church. El siguiente programa es la presentación de la iglesia Surprise. Uh, we're in the middle of a lighthouse series. We're calling it Lighthouse because we are challenging everyone here and everyone in our community to be a lighthouse in their neighborhood. Something we did last December that had such a strong response. We said, we got to do this again. And it's really giving everyone an opportunity. We had tax all over that map last year. We took them all off and said, let's do this again. Let's redeclare. And for those who are new, for the first time, declare that we're not just living in our neighborhood because we like the house, we like the neighborhood, it had good amenities, it had good proximity to uh, a Bed Bath and Beyond or whatever. But, but we, we believe God put us here because he wanted us to do something here, something good. And so we can either get stuck in the rat race of just trying to make it through, or we can think bigger picture, step back from, uh, you know, this block after block schedule of our lives and say, how can I make space and, and leave bandwidth in my life and in my neighborhood to be here for God? And though this series is meant to give us space to do that, um, so if you haven't yet, grab uh, after church, put a tack on that map right where you live and grab the slip on your chair that gives you some steps. How can you be a lighthouse in your neighborhood, including a prayer walk, which we're going to show you in a video in just a few minutes, but what it's like to do a prayer walk in your neighborhood. Last week, as we worked through this series, we asked the question, who is the one person in your life, or more than one, who has permission to speak into your darkness? Now, you notice in the question, I'm assuming two things. First thing I'm assuming is that you have darkness in your life. That there is a, a, a very real and very painful memory or present burden or future concern that you're carrying around. Many, many times from something that maybe happened or didn't happen growing up, from relationships or neglect or, or tragic moments that happened as we became adults, throughout adulthood, trauma, trials of one kind or another. But I, I'm just assuming that you're like me, that, um, that if you just really sat down with someone and told them who you really are and what you've really experienced, you would have quite a story to tell, and, and maybe you're in the middle of that story right now. So I assume you have darkness in your life because you have a brain and you have a heart and you, ha you are a human being. It's called normal. The other thing I'm assuming is that you're not meant to carry that alone, that all of us are intended to have people in our lives that love Jesus and love us enough to tell us the truth. Now the truth, here's the thing, the truth about our darkness is sometimes very encouraging to hear. Sometimes it's very uplifting to hear. It's not what we expected. It's fresh. It's straight from God's heart to people who just have given up on hope. And to hear someone say, wait a minute, you're better than that. God loves you more than you think. You, you are not the person that you are describing. At other times, someone speaking into your darkness is the last thing you want to hear. pastors and I get together a lot and we talk about what we're seeing in our communities and our both our just our, where we live communities and in our church communities and it, it, a lot of great things okay I mean as Randy said you know surprise I think we are twice as large or 50 percent as large as we were last year a lot of growth a lot of life change a lot of new missional communities starting a lot of people getting involved in leadership we're looking at doing some amazing things in 2017 but there's also just this steady drumbeat of pain and brokenness and decisions that if the person or family would have thought them through, they would have never chosen that course of life. Usually what happens is there's a trajectory. There's a trajectory towards uh, uh, huge mistakes that we make that has to do with timing. See, darkness is all about timing. Uh, when, when I talk to a, a, an individual or family or a couple that has just the consequences of behavior or, or neglect have just overwhelmed like a volcano explosion. Usually if we step back and we step back again and ask the why and ask the how, we, 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 it started or at least expanded significantly at a point where they cut off people who might have spoken into it. They walled themselves off from people who, who really have, would have had their best in mind. This is, this is crazy that we do this, but we do this. Christians do this. We will 
withdraw from vulnerability and connection with, with the very people who God has put in our lives to be able to speak encouragement, hope, and sometimes ch- confrontation and challenge because it hurts to have someone say, what are you doing? It hurts because that, that can lead us to shame and disappointment in ourselves and being hard on ourselves. But the reality is if you shut those people out, I can tell you as a pastor, it's going to set in motion a trajectory that eventually you're no longer going to be able to control. And I just plead with you today to don't, don't do that. Don't do it. Last week, we actually said, write a name down, the person that you have invited, or the people, some of the folks wrote five names down, the people in their DNA group or missional community wrote all of their names on their bulletin. Write the names down of the people that you are inviting to know every corner of your life and to speak into it, who love Jesus and love you. Write them down. And if you don't have anybody, write them down and call that person or group after church, text them after church, ask them to get together and invite them into that. Um, don't, don't be so insecure that you can't do that. I'm not speaking to any individual here, so don't take us personally if you and I have talked, okay? I'm speaking to us as a community. Do, I plead with you not to be so insecure that you make your life decisions and walk through your life journey walling off your life from people who could get together with you on a weekly basis, a, a, a regular basis, or be available on a regular basis to speak light into your darkness. And if you are doing that right now, it's okay, but something is broken and God wants to fix that something. And maybe you've been alive 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, and you've never, ever let somebody in on that level with you. That's okay. But I want you to know that that doesn't have to continue. Just because maybe your parents or your grandparents lived in such a kind of a privatized, uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps bubble, that does not mean you have to, okay? It does not mean that you have to be like someone else. This is your moment. I believe this, this is an amazing time in our history as a, as a nation, as a community, as a church. This is your moment because darkness is all about timing. See, in the Old Testament, when they forecast the coming of Jesus, hundreds, even thousands of years before Jesus came, they started, there started to be these prophets who had this unique vision that God was going to do something with the brokenness and the darkness that he saw in the world. The hardest thing for us to accept about God is that he allows us to face the darkness that I mentioned earlier. He, look at your bodies, look at your family, look at your life. Look at the world and look at the news. God allows that. Many people can go no further in faith and have to let that go and let God go because they cannot follow a God who allows those things to exist. However, this has always been true, that God stares into the darkness and promises light. And he allows it for a reason. Here, long, long, centuries before Jesus came, listen to what God said. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has shined. One night, early morning, I guess it was, I got up and I was, I was stumbling downstairs to get something in the kitchen or uh, I can't remember why I was going downstairs, but it was dark enough so that I couldn't see where I was going and I just felt so helpless because the light switch that I knew where the light switches were, I could find them during the day, I found myself, have you ever done this, doing like the braille wall thing, you know, where you know, and you could be 10 or 15 feet away and you're just doing the wax on, wax off, looking for the light switch. And then I just said, the heck with it, I can't find it. So I went to the next room and I'm fumbling. But the sun had come up just enough for a little bit of a shaft of light to be coming through our front door. And that, when I got downstairs, I could actually see enough to flip the light on. This passage says that that light has dawned. As this prophet looks into the future, inspired by God, he says, God knows the darkness that we walk in and he is doing something about it. He will do something about it. And there's going to be a light that comes up that allows us to see and live and thrive. God allows the darkness, but he promises light. And that means something about timing. That means that darkness, as we continue to read through scripture, as we continue to see the the trajectory, the story of God unfold, God intends for the pain and brokenness that has defined his people to be our past and not our future. God wants to adopt us and rename us and redesignate us his own. So when you read scriptures like this from Colossians 1, there's a a letter that was written by a guy named Paul to a a church of people following, trying to follow Jesus shortly after Jesus raised from the dead in the city of Colossae to the Colossian church. God has, here's what he says to them, God has qualified you to share 
in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Now tell me this, when will you get an inheritance? Let's just say your, fam your family is a millionaire family, lucky you, okay. When do you get an inheritance? Somebody has to what? Yeah, somebody has to die, okay. So, Paul is saying you have an inheritance. However, he's also speaking about an inheritance that comes when someone died, the only difference here is that that person already died. So everything you know about inheritance is true about this inheritance, except this inheritance is the only inheritance that already happened. So you're not waiting to get the benefit of this inheritance, it's here. God has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So I put this on a timeline. Light is our past, darkness is our past. And this passage, as you look at the tenses, it means that, that light is intended to be your, your present and your future. Okay, so I want you just to imagine the arc of your life story and just see your life story on that yellow line. I want you to see that, those, that, that bottle feeding era of your childhood and all the ups and downs of the roller coaster of your uh, teenage years and, and, and then your whatever middle age, wherever you are on that arc of time. And maybe the color is not yellow for you. Maybe it's still a dark colored line right now. And maybe your line is just saturated with darkness. Your heart still feels hard and callous from, from something that's been done to you or something that you've been personally guilty of doing to someone else. And I, I want you to acknowledge that, that it's okay to be here today and not be okay. It's okay to be here today and really know that um, you need help, even if you won't admit that to somebody else. And then with that in mind, I want you to listen to this. And I want the most hard heart in the room to soak this up like a sponge in a lake. Listen to this. God has, hear me, hear this, hear God. God has qualified you. There are jobs that you could apply for that you are not qualified for. I probably wouldn't be qualified for your job. But God has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. That is a past tense verb. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. He just did it. He opened the door. More past tense. He has rescued us. Now we're a community together listening to this word from the dominion of darkness and brought us, past tense, into the kingdom of the, of the son he loves, present tense. This is a kingdom and a family dominated by love not competition, not reputation, not pleasure, but love. In whom we have present tense and future indicative. We have redemption, forgiveness of sins. God wants you and I to see ourselves and to envision ourselves every day, increasingly so, as members of a new family with a new name, dominated by love, not the wounds or failures or guilt that has defined the darkness of our past, where we feel redeemed and renamed and where we have forgiveness, where all the things that have happened to us and that have been done to us and that we have done no longer define us and our relationships. And let me ask you today, are you here in a relationship where you are holding bitterness against someone? And that bitterness is a source of power for you to be the victim, to justify wrongdoing, to, to mistreat someone. He has qualified you to live in light and love and that bitterness does not have to define your relationship. You have to let go of that power in order to grab onto his. Because his power is better than mine and yours. He's qualified. You are qualified to do that. You have everything you need. You have to do it. Because light is your future unless we hold on to darkness. Now let me ask you this. Sometimes we hear these churchy words and we say that is awesome and true in theory, but in practice, let me tell you about the people I live with or let me tell you about the people I go to school with or let me tell you about the people that I work with. Not true there. <laughs> How many of you know that person that, you know, if you're just honest, God hates them. I mean, how many of you know that person? <laughs> God just hates them. And when he made him, he's like, God, that was a serious mistake. 
Nobody's raising their hand, but I know you're lying. All of, <laughs> all of us know that person that seems to be one step removed from normal, kind, and, and, and far beyond hope. That when you think of, of sharing the gospel with someone or inviting someone to church or simply doing life with this person, maybe they're in close proximity to you, you think that person is always going to be this way, they are always that way, and, and I can't give them another chance because I don't think God would. I'm not saying you consciously think that. It's back here. It defines how you relate to that person, to that group of people. So is this true for everyone? Or is there just exceptions that are beyond hope? Is that person you live with or work with or go to school with or live next to beyond hope or not? Acts 17, Paul goes into a city of Athens and he looks around all he sees are fake gods and fake altars because they were so superstitious that they would send a sheep out and wherever the sheep stopped, they would build an altar there and they just like, oh, let's call, let's, let's de designate a new god for this location and try to appease the gods because, you know, we got to figure out how to control the weather and the plagues and the problems that are happening all around us. So Paul goes into the city and he sees people doing anything, trying to figure out how to control life and how to understand God. And he just says, let me, can I just call a timeout and can we hang out and... Can we sort this out? Because I have something really important to tell you. And, and he does not quote a single Bible verse because these people would not have valued it or gotten it at all. He actually quotes their Greek poetry to help them understand, to help them understand that God is even close to people who have no concept of who he is. Look at this. Acts 17, God says to them, God structured each person's life so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. Put that person that I asked you to think about right in the front of your mind right now, that person that you believe is maybe beyond hope, who you've given too many chances to, or who you don't think God would give another chance to. Picture that person. God structured each person's life. He allowed us to experience our human limitations and boundaries and brokenness and the pain of this life so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. The Greek word for reach out is, is, to, is literally to grope in the darkness. God allows us to experience life not because he's mean, because he wants us to go through the hardship of life so that we could grope for something greater. And that's true even about that person in your life. Though he is not far from any one of us. And then he goes ahead and quotes their poets. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. I want to suggest that this has profound implications for everyone you relate to in the spheres of influence of life that you have. What if you went through life assuming that God is absolutely juxtaposed, just fused right there with every single person, and he's working every day within their storyline to draw them closer to his light out of their darkness? What if you assumed that? What would it mean for how you play your role in just edging them one step closer? What kind of neighbor would you be if you knew that God was this close to everyone in your neighbor? What kind of family member would you be if you knew that God was passionately trying to draw the broken people you live with one step closer to the light every single day? What kind of role would you play? Or, and this is the other option, would, would you and I be so focused on ourselves that we didn't even think about it? You want to be a generous person? You want to be a generous church have to think about that. This morning, I brought in nine more um, tags. The, the, the um, United Way gave us 75 tags last Sunday representing 75 kids who will not get Christmas presents unless someone else steps up because their parents are not living or not around. And we didn't even get through the whole service. People that have just grabbed them and said, I want to buy for a kid. I want my kids to experience that. Today, I said, well, well, you know, if we don't give them all away during the early service, we'll give them away at the 11 o'clock. And the 930 service took that personally. And they didn't even make it out of that section before we'd given away all nine tags for nine more kids. I'm really, really proud of this church because it means that we are not so obsessed with ourselves and our own schedules and our own routines and our own goals and our own plans that we can't think about his. We're not so obsessed with sorting through our own darkness that we can't think about others. Katie and Matt decided that they weren't just going to live in their neighborhood as they plan their wedding. They also are planning how to be light to their neighbors. And so they bake bread, yummy bread, 
and they found some cool stuff online of doing some kind of anonymous thing that they would pass it on to neighbor to neighbor to neighbor and they got this movement started in their neighborhood. It's up on our Facebook page if you want to learn about what they did and perhaps do it yourself. And everyone who put a tack on that map is watching the videos on the Lighthouse page and learning how to take a prayer walk in the neighborhood. I'm going to have you just watch this video real quick before we conclude about what it looks like to take a prayer walk in your neighborhood and recognize that God is very, very close. Okay, as, as we uh, turn the lights back on, I want to invite you to grab those three postcards on your chair and just take a look at uh, those postcards. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Okay, and if you wouldn't mind, uh, I'm going to invite the band back up, wherever the band might be, and we're going to close in just a second. But um, I, I, I crossed out cards, and I just put the word invitation here because these three are not meant for you. You know where to get information. You can go to our website, bulletin. This is meant for someone who, who might be living next to you, might be living with you, might be working next to you, going to school, uh, but they need an invitation from you. That's why you're in relationship with them. Um, so I invite you just to think or even write down the names of at least three people that you can think of that would love that invitation. Somebody might say no, and that's okay, but there's somebody that's going to appreciate it and say yes because someone invited you. And if it weren't for that person, you may not be here. Here's why, more than anything. I find that if, if Jesus is a guy I just think about on Sundays, um, he's my imaginary friend. And now imaginary friends, if you've got an imaginary friend, you probably don't talk about them because it will make you feel kind of weird. I mean, if she has an imaginary friend, it's fine. Four-year-olds are supposed to, but grown-ups tend to not talk about their imaginary friends. And if Jesus is someone that I can't talk about and I, I don't bring into my work relationships, even when it's appropriate, I don't look for ways to share him, I don't look for ways to invite folks to consider this thing that supposedly is the most important thing in my life, but I talk about everything else, Jesus becomes a non-existent imaginary friend to me. So as important as it is to invite people into this for their sake, it's also important for you so that Jesus doesn't just become an imaginary friend that is just there for good luck on Sundays. Remember, the people that you're living with, working with, going to school with, God is close to them. Would you hold those three invitations in your hand as we close and close in song and then we'll go uh, grab a bite to eat. So stand, grab those invitations, just pray with me before we close in song. Jesus, we pray that these three invitations re reflect our solid faith that God is very, very close, not just to us, but to the people that these invitations are for. That you are not far from people in our lives. That we, we, You don't depend on us to save them, to love them, to help them understand you, but you will work through us and that we shouldn't be afraid of that. We should be excited about that. We shouldn't be in despair about people that seem hard to work with or deal with because we have a God who's close to that person who will work through their stubbornness and pride as we extend your grace, kindness, and clarity. Now is the time, Father. This is a great time to point to the greatest story ever. Give us the courage to invite, the courage to share, and the courage to pray for our neighbors. In Jesus' name, all God's saints said, amen. Let's sing.